Hello. Welcome to the Call Like I See It podcast. I'm James Keyes, and in this episode of Call Like I See It, we're going to take a look at two separate stories that have been in the news lately. The first involving Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, and the second involving California Senator Dianne Feinstein. And we're going to discuss how these stories, even though they're clearly distinct from like a potential wrongdoing standpoint, and just in general, they're, they're different stories, but they both evidence a sentiment we're seeing a lot these days where our public servants seem to be serving themselves or putting their own interests ahead of the people and the country. And later on, we're going to discuss some recent research that's been going on into the the development of a commercially viable enzyme that can pull CO2 out of the air and turn it into useful products, which would be amazingly helpful from the standpoint of global warming and climate change. Joining me today is a man who is always in the state of mind to podcast. Tunde Ogun Lana. Tunde, are you ready to show everybody why the world is yours? Yeah, actually, I don't want the whole world. <laughs> I just want a nice place with a dock. I can put a boat and relax and have a nice life. The, the okay. whole world. Well, if I had the whole world, it would be like too stressful. It's just too much going on. <laughs> I'd, I'd have to, I'd have well, to deal I, with. I wish we had some more of that. that Humility and mod- yeah. mod- modesty, and 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 then I guess what we'll talk about today. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd have to deal with just too much, so <laughs> I don't want all. Now that. we're recording this on April twenty fourth, twenty twenty three, and earlier this month, beginning with an extensively sourced report from ProPublica, Pro we've seen that Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas has apparently been receiving and not disclosing gifts for decades, like gifts like free vacations, property that's been bought, you know, that he'd want purchased and bought or don't monetary donations, you know, to in his name or to his wife's groups or, you know, whatever. And they've been from real estate developer and mega Republican mega donor Harlan Crow. Now, it should be noted that as the Supreme Court rules stated at the time, at least this wasn't necessarily against those rules. Many legal experts do say that it may run afoul or it does run afoul of some Watergate era laws designed to prevent corruption. But we're not really here today to discuss the legality of Thomas's conduct. We want to discuss how what he's doing is really just undermining the credibility of like, forget himself. This is undermining the credibility of the Supreme Court and the U.S. government. You know, when when you when people see it looks like the appearance of something looks like somebody's on the take. That undermines confidence in the whole system. And this is a system that's of the people, by the people, for the people. And confidence is very important in that. So it ultimately seems to just be a really selfish thing to do. So to get us started, Tunde, what has stood out to you in these recent revelations about what Clarence Thomas has been doing, Clarence Thomas has been doing, from the standpoint of how it affects people's perception of our government and just kind of the mindset that, you know, kind of the disregard of that, that it, that it, it demonstrates? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, you set it up well already. You, you pretty much said that it it, it hurts the trust uh, that I think a lot of people have in the system. And, you know, and this is why this one is one of those interesting ones, because you made a point that, which is true, that in a, like he hasn't done anything necessarily illegal because the Senate, sorry, not the Senate, the Supreme Court, who we're talking about here, apparently um, doesn't have any ethics rules uh, or um, is, is, is above having to disclose certain things and all that. So, um, and I, I recognize that there is a line that we all consider with general stuff about what is legal and what might be right or wrong, right? So I'm not saying, you know. And I mean, we shouldn't go down that path too much though, because more will come out and then we'll see, more will be analyzed. And no, I know. We, we, we're I'm, not in a position what, right now to really say, but as of right now, it's not clear that there's well, been some kind of yeah there doesn't appear to be any crimes committed and and what i'm getting at here is again i'm i'm just i feel like this is sad for the system not to pile on to clarence thomas individually like that but to because of the way i again the way i see the reactions unfolding kind of in the public square and the discourse right so for people that don't agree with thomas this is another proof of you know cronyism and all that and and again unethical behavior from someone that we all think should know better than to be sitting, you know, a, a, as a judge hearing cases that might have been brought to him um, through friends or directly by someone who's he's been in bed with financially. 
So that seems bad on its surface, whether it's legal or illegal, right? And then the people that are out there, you know, that want to defend Clarence Thomas are pointing to things like that, like, yeah, well, this isn't illegal and all this. And so my point is, that's why I say it's kind of sad because I see that it's going to create more apathy in the system from the public because I think most of the public, whether this is illegal or not, we, we've all been taught to think of the law as something kind of important and that people that operate within the law, like lawyers and judges, should basically be moral character, you know, a good moral character and should disclose things, especially if they're going to be ruling on um, certain areas that maybe people that they've had financial ties with. Well, yeah, those are, are the norms of our system. So that's you what I'm know, saying. Like, yeah, so, whether it's laws or not at the Supreme Court, the norms of our system is to try to avoid conflict of interest, things like that. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's why to me, it's more of a sad situation for all of us because no matter what all this ends up being, and, and clearly, I mean, we've seen enough, right? But But it's just like, you know, because you can't help but think like everything else, what else is going on? How long has this been going on? You know, did this influence anything? It's just not a good look, you know? Yeah, I mean, no, that, that sums it up. I mean, and it, the thing, a couple of things that stood out to me about this. One would be that you, you use the term political and talked about this from a political uh, partisanship kind of standpoint, one side and the other side. And I think that's part of the problem, honestly, is that this is not like these disclosures here are not this is not a political issue. This isn't about like he didn't do this stuff because he was or he he, he leans Republican like his po political leanings or his political like that has nothing to do with this. This guy was doing things that whether it's against any ethical rules, if it's not against ethical rules, it's because there are no rules as far as the, eth the ethics. It is unethical. It is a conflict of interest for him to do this, to take this money like this and not disclose it. If he's disclosing it, that's a whole nother thing. So. Again, whether or not it, there is a rule in place to say that it, it is it, it is against the ethical rules, what's ethical and what's not is governed by a higher standard than that. What's a conflict of interest or not is governed by a higher standard than that. And he knows that, you know, like this is something that lawyers go through from day one in terms of conflicts of interest, ethics, professional responsibility and so forth. So that he went down this road, basically, to me, it's really a, just a disregard of our norms of our system, because you make it about yourself and not about putting up our system that we're all sub our constitution and this government of the people, by the people, for the people that we're all supposed to put put, put first in this yeah. country, so to speak. So, but the, the issue of making it about politics, it's not about politics. If someone calls out Clarence Thomas for having, say, hey, you have conflicts of interest here. Why weren't you ta disclosing this stuff? Or why were you putting yourselves in these situations? That's not a political attack. He did something that wasn't political, and but it was something that is not necessarily consistent with the norms of the country, and you call him out on it. Now, and if you defend him necessarily, you're going to, the, the best defense for him in this case, because there is no factual defense, apparently, or else that we would have heard it so far, there is no, oh, well, it's actually, it, it's not wrong for him to do this. There's no defense like that. It's like, oh, no, no, it's just not against the rules. I, di I didn't mean for the guy to buy my mom's house. <laughs> I, I didn't exactly. mean that. But, but then you say, okay, well, I can defend this person by making it political. Oh, you're only attacking him because you disagree with him politically and so forth. And I think that's the toxicity, basically, is that, oh, well, our actors in our system know that they can get away with anything yeah. if... And it, it, it think doing things that aren't political things, but doing wrong, if they just say, oh, well, people are just attacking me because of my politics. And it's like, well, hold on. Is there any objective criteria anymore as far as right and wrong? Is everything just politics? If you do something wrong, then if I like somebody, then I got to defend it. And if I don't like them, then I can't defend or I have to you know, go after them for it. I can only go after them for it if I if I don't like them. And so to me, that's a deterioration across the board. But it's the selfish behavior like this that leads to that. Like, where are the people that say, look. This stuff isn't acceptable. You know, I was hoping to see John Roberts do that. You know, honestly, like this, defend the Supreme Court. This is not acceptable. Well, it, at minimum, it won't happen again. Yeah. No. So here's the thing. And you're right. I mean, I mean, we would expect the leader, leader of the Supreme Court, the chief justice to to get ahead of this somehow, um, which hasn't happened clearly. And look, this is why, like you're saying, this is. And, and again, we can use many examples from powerful people uh, in our government over the history of the country. Um, so it's not to single out Thomas as the only one that's ever 
kind of been caught with a hand in the cookie jar, so to speak. Well, but, but, but there, see, there the is point though. Like that <laughs> point is fine and good, but he's the one that did something that we're talking about right now. Like I don't think you need I to know. preface what the I'm fact is, of clearly he's not the first person to ever do something wrong. Well, no, I think clearly it's look. There's something about being in a position of power, but I think the fact that this is the Supreme Court and he's a judge makes this worse. I would uh, agree than, on that. Then a normal, like if it was a senator or a congressman, he's not up for election. Yeah, he doesn't. And, he can't. Well, no, it's he, also he, just like I know we're supposed to. All politicians are supposed to be highly respectable and all that, but we've gotten used to this idea that you know politicians can't do some underhanded things. And I just think <laughs> we already don't trust them already. Anyway. Yeah, I know exactly. Like, you know, <laughs> Mayor Daley in Chicago, you know, all that, all that kind of stuff. The Iran Contra affair. I mean, that's my point. Like we get it, right? That politicians will do certain things. But I think judges to me, this, you know what I think of as we're talking uh, two examples. One is remember the referee scandal in the NBA. Yeah. A couple of years not ago, a, like probably five, 10 years a, ago. Yeah. yeah. And then, and then, you know, someone like Pete Rose, right. Who was never, Unfortunately, you're going to be in the Hall of Fame because he gambled while he was playing baseball. And I think that's the kind of stuff. Well, to be clear, and, he gambled and then he agreed to be banned. Like he, he, he that was part of his agreement. To all right, be well, but not to digress. Okay. But I think the referee one's actually better because it's mm-hmm. like we figure. Like I'm thinking about it as I said that I'm like, yeah, we, I know professional athletes have done some BS, you know. But we always expect the the actual referees, umpires, you know, the guys that are actually calling the balls and strikes and blowing their whistles to actually be nonpartisan about it, right? That they, 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 they don't have a dog in the fight, that they're calling a fair game. And when we learned well, that I there think was- what it is, actually, let me say that a little differently because what it is, and this is what, I think this is a, a, a fair expectation. Everybody knows people have biases. People have like, like there's books about it all the time as far as like our, how we see things. It's, you know, like it's unconscious bias, all that stuff. But what we expect from them, what, and you're probably right, we don't really expect this from politicians that much anymore. It's, a, it's like a surprise if we see it in a politician. But in a judge, it's like, at least try to be fair. Try, like, you're supposed to put the effort in. Like, okay, let me try to set aside my biases or what I would like to see happen and make a ruling or do an analysis based on a, a intellectual exercise based on the law. Like, let's try. I think that's really what it is, is we expect them to be the ones that, that actually are trying. The refs, hey, try. I know the crowd is loud and everybody, but try to do things, you know, on an on above board basis. Judges, try. I think the effort is the key piece there. Because yeah. people will, ne- will always have some bias in them. Well, no, and I think that's why I think the, the referee in sports example is is more appropriate than than the other one, than, the, than just the athlete themselves. Because, again, and that's why to me the NBA scandal was 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 similar because we expect the referee, let's well, say NBA now because we're talking about that one, to walk onto the court and not be influenced by money, right? Not be influenced by their feelings. And I was watching a documentary recently. That's why it came into my mind. And this group of referees, one of the guys they hated was Allen Iverson. They never gave reason, but they just hated him. And they specifically showed the game because I guess now that they all been busted and went to jail and all that, um, the guy, the, they were interviewing the actual referee. And he said, yeah, we agreed. I told him Iverson's mind. We're going to call him on, on palming the ball. And they showed exactly in the playoffs where they're making these calls. And it cost the Denver Nuggets the game um, and made it cost them a playoff spot. So the, the or, or that that series in the playoffs. So I feel like from what we learned about Clarence Thomas, that, you know, the, the gentleman's paying for his mother and other family members homes and then they're living there for free. Then we find out that the gentleman's sitting on boards of think tanks that have brought certain cases in front of the Supreme Court, all of which Thomas has ruled in favor of. And then recently today, I mean, the news is coming out today that, you know, there is some direct financial um, uh, or sorry, that Mr. Crow did have business himself in front of the court, which when Thomas was ruling and and never said, I should recuse myself because this is my friend and we have a personal relationship. And I think that's the other thing, too, right? Like no one's trying to beat up, at least me, he's not trying to beat up um, Clarence Thomas for going on $500,000 vacations and to be on super yachts that are owned by his friends. That's fine. But see, that's it's, not really just, fine, though. If he wants no, to be a Supreme Court is, judge, is, then he probably shouldn't do that stuff. He should make a choice. Like, hey, I want to live a lavish life or I want to be a public servant. No, well, here, here's the way. I'm not going to disagree with you, but I, I just think different, right? I think as long as he discloses it and he recuses himself from the cases that involve the friends he's hanging around, I, I, I can't have a problem with that, me personally. But the fact he didn't disclose it 
And now we learn that there were cases from this gentleman and then groups he was leading and that Clarence Thomas seems to have constantly voted that way. Again, it's a disrespect to the court and to the system because now maybe he would have voted that way anyway. I don't but know. He probably he didn't know the guy. Like that's the yeah. thing about it. Like, like nobody is questioning his bona fides as far as voting in a certain direction every single time. He's yeah. not a swing vote Listen, in the court. This is but this is it's still no, but your point. Let me just I, I want to say yeah. that again. Your point is so good. It's damaging to the system. It's very selfish for him to do that and to put everyone else in that position now. You know, like it's like, what are you doing, man? You're you're sinking everybody. Like you every everybody thinks we're the, the court's on the take now. And my biggest issue actually with Thomas, though, I want to say is that I'm not out here saying resign or this or that. Like, I want a clear directive and signal from the Supreme Court. And Thomas did come out and say, I'm not, I'm going to report everything now. I understand this is now. So I, I appreciate that. I want it from Robert. So I want everybody, like, look, this is unacceptable. We won't do like the fact that we're kind of just trying to push this to the side. And that to me furthers the, it's never the crime it's the cover up, right? It furthers the, the, uh, my concern is the, 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 how people are looking at the system following this. The system only holds together with public confidence. That's the only way it holds together. If we can have confidence in the court, have conf- enough confidence in the political actors, if it doesn't have that stuff, then we're on our way to, to one person just taking over and saying, I can solve all the problems. And that's not the direction I want to go with this. So to me, where's just the clear direction that, look, this is wrong. This won't happen again. And we'll, we'll move forward from that. That to me is, is the biggest thing we can, we can pull from something like this. You can't really go back in the past. It was bad. It was a conflict of interest. And you know, where do we go from here is more what I'm, I'm looking at and putting yourself above the system to try to, it has happened. Don't again, don't then follow that by putting yourself above the system to try to save your skin and say, Oh, well, this is all oh good, all good. Anyway, I should have been able to do it anyway. Well, I think, you know, that old term, uh, what is it? Absolute power corrupts absolutely. Um, again, that's why these things should be remembered for all of us. Uh, and like you said about it's not a partisan statement. And clearly, um, Clarence Thomas, through his actions, is corrupted in some way, just the fact he didn't disclose the stuff. Um, and so my point is, is that, you know, and this, like you said it well, like this, this just it, 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 it's a bad look for the system. And I think that. And to compare, yeah. let me let me say this, because to compare to your NBA example, that's what the NBA did after the, the referee scandal. They came out. P- people were out like, look, well, now and again, I'm not saying that Clarence Thomas has to be out here, but they can say, look, this is unacceptable. Moving forward. This isn't going to happen. You know, we're going to put in this and that and so that it doesn't happen anymore. But they made it drew a clear line and just said, look, no, we're not defending this. We're not out here saying, no, 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 it's all good because of this or that. Or the people that are attacking us, they're just mad because their team lost. Or like they didn't come out and do all that. Like, let's come out. Let's 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 defend the system before we start looking. Hey, how can we defend our people? And honestly, I mean, that's why we're the two topics we're tying together today and, and the, the absolute power thing, or at least power, it's remembered power corrupts itself. It's absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. Just power on its yeah. own it corrupts. But the second topic we want to talk about today is a similar kind of manifestation again, of putting yourself above your role as a public servant and the system that you operate in. And that's what Diane Feinstein, which who's the Senator out of California who, you know, Hope, hope she gets well. You know, I hope that I mean, she's been sick. She's been out for a few months now, not at, at her job, but she's 89. And, you know, there she is essentially not able to show up to work consistently anymore. And it, there have been questions about her fitness for some years. But at this point, I mean, that's that's a, a, another issue. There's a different issue of just not being able to show, not being able to be available. You know, yeah. like that's something that's a part of of going to work or being, you know, having a job, whatever the job is. So. What was your like? And again, it's not. This isn't something. This isn't conflict of interest. This isn't unethical. This is just like okay, you're unable to show up, but you still want to hold on to the job, you know? Like what? But what? I'm gonna throw it to you. Let me, let me just let you get in here. Like, uh, it's not as damning, obviously. But with her hanging on, even though it, it appears she may not be capable of performing the job anymore, you know, like what's your reaction to that? Do you see that as another example of this kind of like people putting themselves over the system? Yeah. I mean, I do. I think um, that's why it's a two interesting stories of of two high profile people within our government system who are being selfish and in different ways. Uh, so that's why yeah, I think that's it's a, a good, really key point. It's a, different it's a, ways of kind of the same yeah, thing it, it, or the same sentiment, good, I should say. 
good contrast because, you know, we just got done with, with beating up Thomas a bit about his, um, you know, and I, and I would say, I think we deserved that. He, we believe he deserves to get beat up for this one. You know, what, what, what we've all found out. And then the same thing, I'll beat up Diane Feinstein for the same thing. Um, cause it reminds me a lot of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, which again, was someone who at one point in her career was considered a trailblazing female, uh, lawyer who then ascended to Supreme Court and was well liked by, you know, people that supported her and, and, and her views and all that. And then near the end of her life, it became, you know, that no one like that she's some kind of queen that no one can touch. And what I find interesting is her whole mission was about pro-choice and, 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 and women's rights and all this stuff. And because she held on too long and couldn't resign from the Supreme Court, she unfortunately passes away and her seat is filled with someone by, by, by another woman, but someone who was pro-life. And, you know, what is it, two years later or so, um, the Roe versus Wade is reversed, which would have been exactly what Ruth Bader Ginsburg would not want to see happen. And I find what a contrast with Dianne Feinstein, who is now doing the same thing, which is hanging on too long. And like you said, I don't care if she's old, is the fact that she can't show up to work. Why is she doing this to her own party and to the American people? Because like any other job, if you don't show up for work for a while, they probably fire you, right? Um, or you got to have a serious you know, <laughs> excuse as to why you can't show up. The, um, and, and especially if you're, uh, you know, you're a big part of the functioning. And my point is, Diane Feinstein's another quote unquote trailblazing woman who, you know, had a great political career from being a local politician in her hometown all the way to the, she's now the longest serving female senator in history and one of the longest serving senators in history. And, you know, she sits on the Judiciary Committee and it's interesting because her inability to show up is costing the Democrats the ability to put judges on the court which could have the same effect as Ruth Bader Ginsburg, someone who is pro-choice and who wants to champion women's rights may be hurting the ability for her party to put judges on that will continue to do that. And it's yeah. just, it's just a it's, fascinating. It's, there's an irony to that. Yeah. I mean, and I look yeah. at it honestly from a, a different context though, because th that, that is like the RBG and now uh, uh, kind of comparison. And then looking at it from that lens, it's a legitimate lens, but that's still looking at it from the lens of, a like a, a oh well this is messed up for the democratic party like i'm looking at it from the standpoint of just from the nation like the people of california deserve to have two senators there you know like and it's like well if well, doesn't this undermine the 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 senate if we're saying okay you this person is 89 years old like that's if you're she's a pilot she wouldn't be there anymore because we're gonna say yeah. okay well we need to have you know there's certain ages or so that you have to be and i don't think ageism when you're talking about at a certain age is a, a legitimate complaint, so to speak. Like, no, 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 at a certain age, before a certain age, we all seem to agree that you shouldn't be able to do certain things. And I mean, after a certain age, we, we, we seem to, we should be able to agree like, well, Hey, after a certain age, maybe, got, you know, maybe we shouldn't have people in certain on positions. Like, I'll oh, go ahead. What'd you say? I got, I got a joke when you're done. Go ahead. Oh, okay. But <laughs> the thing Don't jump is, too far. <laughs> okay. Well, but the thing is, I mean, looking at it just from a, again, they, they, this is like, this to me reeks of, hey, I, 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 I've been here. For, you said the longest serving female senator, one of the longest serving. Like, I can't leave because like, what would be the reason why I say, you know what? Yeah, like I, I'm, I'd rather, you know, ride off into the sunset here. You know, I don't want to be the person that's not there for six months. Like other than hubris, why else would you still be there? You know, if you can't show up every day, like that's the part I don't get. Like, what interest is she serving? She's not in a state. She's in a state with if, if she is worried about the political aspect of it, like the, the, the partisan aspect of it. She's in a state with a Democratic governor who will appoint a Democrat as a replacement. Like, I can't think of any other reason other than hubris why she would say I have to stay here, even though I can't be there. And so to me, that's where it's the example of I'm putting myself above the system. The system says there should be two senators here and that they should be showing up and doing stuff and everything like that. And she's like, no, I, that's that's not going to be it. You know, now took she was elected, you know, like she was elected uh, five years ago. So no, nobody can make her and nobody should make her step down. 
But this is where, again, look at let's hold ourselves to a higher standard. Let's say, hey, you know what? I've had a great run, you know, and, and again, there's no if, if, if somebody can articulate a reason to me, then I can, I'm open to changing my mind on this. But I just can't see any reason other than just personal. Hey, I'm that important. So I'm going to stay here. I don't care if you know, I don't care if it does this. I don't care if it does that. You know, like California, you can make do with one senator while I'm gone. Yeah, no. So and I, I agree with you. I think that um, <laughs> it's not just the person themselves. It's also and I get it. This is kind of the human element of it. Because I was reading one of the articles that I know that will be posted on the show notes um, where Nancy Pelosi has suggested sexism is at play in the calls to resign. That's the quote from the article. And um, uh, I don't, she quote, she's quoted saying, I don't know what political agendas are at work that are going after Sen- Senator Feinstein in that way. Um, but it's Democrats I, 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 asking her to step down. I, I've never seen a man. I've seen, never seen them go after a man who was sick in the Senate in this way, in that way. And I think that's kind of the sad part. I was like, all right, I get it. They're both from San Francisco. I'm sure, they, I'm sure they've been friends for 50 years. But it's like the joke I was going to say when I read that at first, you know what I thought of? And this is definitely off, off. This is a tangent. Remember Madonna? I think she did the Oscars or something a couple months ago. Yeah. And she looked terrible. Like yeah, yeah. she was all puffy fade. You know, this is a... She looked like she had a bad plastic surgery job and everybody was talking about it. And she kept saying it was ageism, ageism. Yeah. <laughs> I remember telling my wife, you know, I don't think it's ageism because when I look at Dolly Parton, who's 76, who's 10 years, more than 10 years older than Madonna, she looks pretty good for her age. I think Cher, I think Jane Fonda. I mean, there's a lot of older women that are in like 70s and 80s that I think they look good for their age, that, you know. I, I, as a 45 year old man, I'm not sexually attracted to them, but I, I think that they're good looking older women, right? Yeah, you and did, I was like, did decide I, to take this into an interesting direction. Yeah, I was direction. like, no, Madonna, it ain't ageism. You just look like this, you know? And so, <laughs> and so that's what I mean. Like, that's what I felt when I read the Pelosi thing. Like, this ain't sexism. This lady can't show up for a freaking job. That's why. <laughs> you know yeah, what I mean? I mean and that's kind and of it's that. like, and it's funny because, yeah, Mitch McConnell recently banged his head. He fell down some stairs and was out for like six weeks and came back. And then John Fetterman, I guess, from the Democrat side, um, had a, um, you know, had to go to a hospital for depression for two months or something. But all those guys were coming back, and they're not eighty nine. So, so she looks like it's been years of her slowly getting more decrepit, and now she's yeah, eighty nine. That's, that's that's you see what part I'm saying. It's like well, she's eighty nine with the shingles. That don't sound too good. Well, but also remember, I mean, like there were a couple years ago, there were there were people talking like, hey, you know, like they were saying cognitive capability that they were questioning yeah, yeah, whether she still was that. was as well, sharp you know as everything funny? so because i remember one of her um people on her team which again this is the human part they're going to defend and circle the wagons they were they were interviewed and it was like her chief of staff or something somebody high up on her team is you know the, the behind the scenes and they were saying well how come you know we don't just put another why don't you just resign and put someone like you're saying just do the right thing for the country to party all that and put someone there that is going to be more with it and not have cognitive issues. And the chief of staff was like, oh, it would be a disaster if we put anyone else up there and all that. And that's what I'm saying. Like, yeah, that's hubris. hubris. Like, yeah. I mean, it's going to be a disaster. It's a disaster now. The lady can't even think straight. <laughs> and well, it, it goes I mean, back to all the fears people had about Biden. Like, she's the one really, like, who's really actually typing stuff and and, and whispering in her ear how to vote and all that? Because somebody must be, because she can't seem to be doing it all that herself at this age. And it's it's just really unfortunate. I mean, it's something that like, again, I would not advocate for anybody forcing her to do anything. It's just why I, I wish she would do, like you said, do the right thing here. You know, like it's not something that like we, we ask our public servants to be held to a higher standard. Most of them, you know, don't necessarily try or always try to live up to that. But it's still not wrong for us as citizens to ask that. Well, and you so know, to what? me, she should be okay. looking to do the Like it, it it's something that like you can't hold on forever. And this is, I, I was actually going to bring up the, the power corrupting thing um, with this topic to be able to connect both of them in this. Cause this to me, it looks like both like Clarence Thomas yeah. behaving as if the, all of the normal trappings and temptations that we try to avoid, those won't apply to him. He doesn't have to worry about that. He can take all the gifts and all that and it won't change. You know, he, he won't change the like, rules or anything like that. And that's hubris. That's like, look, yes, you're saying you, are above the normal human or every other human that, you know, yeah, if, if this is why bribes are illegal <laughs> because they don't want people to, you know, like they know how people are, are susceptible to influ- be influenced. Same thing here. It's like, look, the, if you can't do it anymore, 
don't hold on because of this mindset of, oh, I'm the only one that can do it. If I, if I leave, it'll be a disaster. And it's like, well, what? You know, like, so this is not what George Washington thought, so to speak. You know, George Washington, like, you know, I got to leave so that people can then pick up and keep moving. I mean, this, the, the country doesn't rely on and has never relied on one person being able to stay there forever. And so to me, it's, it's, it's just something to take a look at and say, you know what? Yeah, I'm, I'm not pushing for you. You have to do anything. But I wish you would do the right thing here. If you can't do the job anymore, if, if you're if whether it's cognitive decline or just from an age standpoint, you're having a difficult time staying, you know, like staying healthy, then I mean, it's time to go. I mean, there's a there's a time for everything. Yeah, I, think, I want to um, ask you just okay. you know, before we yeah. close this up real quick, just what are we doing wrong from a systemic standpoint or just in, in the system that we aren't able like that, that we still have all these holes that we're, again, it's not like. I don't look at these things as people coming at it in bad faith. Like, oh, we're like neither one of these examples. I would look and say, hey, these guys are in their back of their mind. Like, yeah, I'm going to screw over everybody. It's not that. It's just it's the natural kind of evolution of someone in power, the trappings of power and so forth. And then it kind of changes you or it does whatever to you or it, it brings certain things out of you. And we end up in these very foreseeable situations. And the public is just like, oh, there's nothing we can do. Yeah. Well, and I also think specifically with someone like Feinstein, because of her advanced age, it's also just, you know, at some point people, I think your, your allusion to airline pilots was very good, you know, for the audience, airline pilots generally are f- forced to retire at 65 because it's seen it as a very important job and you're flying a bus in the sky with 300 people in it. And, you know, if someone has onsets of dementia or Alzheimer's, they may not even know it. And so yeah. instead of taking a risk of, Maybe a pilot being 68 or 72 and excellent pilot their whole career, but now they're starting to forget. Because remember, a lot of times when people start having those things, they don't announce it to the world. They're usually scared themselves. They're in denial. And, you know, this is it starts with people not finding certain things around the house or leaving the oven on. But you don't want that happening when you're 30,000 feet in the air that the pilot forgot which button to push, right? Yeah. And I think the same thing in government. Like, I don't want someone who literally is 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 – having those kind of issues that's voting on legislation um, or deciding important court cases. That's not fair to the rest of us. So I think just like what was done after FDR got four terms and we put a constitutional limit on presidential terms, I think, you know, and this has been talked about, I'm not the only guy that thinks this, right? But you didn't term come limits, up with this idea? No, no <laughs> that, that, unfortunately it wasn't me. Uh, but term, term limits, I think, for all politicians in the federal level. I mean, you know, maybe the Senate gets um, three terms max, you know, 18 years, and then you're out. And then the, the, we could say nine terms for Congress to give it the equal 18 years. And, but the idea is that, remember, the, the whole idea of the U.S. government was supposed to be you go from a, being a butcher, a baker, a candlestick maker to the to, to the politician, and you go home and you go back to being the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker. This wasn't intended to be a career for people. And so I think that's one thing. And I think with the judges... Maybe making it like they do, we've talked about this on other discussions about other topics, like the Fed chair or the FBI director. You just make it a long enough term that it straddles X amount of, you know, like maybe 21 years or something like that, where it straddles enough administrations that you can't really fix it partisan wise. But it's also something where if someone shows up at 50, then at least by 71, they're out. And you don't have to worry about the same potential because Clarence Thomas isn't this, but we could have the same issues of cognitive decline, like we talked about with Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So to avoid some of this stuff, I think that's the key. And then I think the other thing is, man, you said it best several times, the idea of public service. You know, what does that mean? Does it mean that because you're a big judge now and your buddies are flying private jets that they can just give you financial gifts, quote unquote, without disclosing it? Or does it mean that if you're only making 240000 a year as a judge, even the top judge, that you should accept that because you chose to do that as a public servant. And because you sat, sit on the Supreme Court, guess what? If you decide to resign, I guarantee you the top law firms in the country yeah, are going to be hiring you five you million dollar salary. <laughs> yes, with all this, uh, you know, equity in the firm and all that, yes. and they'll get to ride in a private jet. Yes. And they'll be able to make a lot of money. So. Again, what, what is this assumption that we should be able to have it all, all the exactly, time? Exactly, that's like, what I mean. That's like, like, like there are trade offs in life, and and the thing is the same with Feinstein as a public servant, a step down at some point and do the right thing. Well, so. for me, I would say 
the I, I less on term limits. I think the term limits are legit, and you know I'm happy that they're there on, as far as presidential. But I would want more. I look at more of the age. Maybe call me an ageist, but I'm like, look, man, you should you hit eighty or something like that or whatever it is. It should be like, okay. Well, that's just once once you've hit that, then you know, like there's no more running, you know, so to speak. And again, I don't think that that's some crazy thing to suggest. We all seem to agree that you got to be 35 to one for president. Like we don't just let people run just, you know, like there, there are qualifications. And so to say that, OK, well, you, you can start running for president and once you're 35 and then once you hit, you know, 75 or 80 or 82 or whatever, then that's it. You can't run for president anymore. That's not like that doesn't fundamentally change anything. And so to me, because I think it's an age thing. The, the term aspect of it, if some, like if you if someone starts early, then you could get termed out and still be a productive person. My issue was more of can you still handle the job more than anything? Now, granted, I'm not one saying that career politicians is the only way to go, but I think we it's fine having a mix of pe- some people, some people in there that have been there a long time, and some people in there that come the, the fresh blood, and so to speak. I think we're fine having a mix. So it's not like we have all people that have only been. No, there I agree, but think about with my idea of the term limit. Let's say nine terms for Congress, or you know, eighteen years, you know, or or, or three terms for the Senate. Um, and for the audience, that the senators serve six year terms, and 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 Congress is two year terms. Meaning, I'm not saying what age you can run. Somebody could run at 60, and maybe that keeps them there well, till 78. What I'm saying is that or, if someone starts you know I mean? at 40, then they're going to be – if someone stops at 30, they're going to be out in, under that the, the term limit thing before someone hey, starts at that's, 40. And so that's I don't part mind. of the game. Yeah. But, so to me, it's more like I said, if a pilot – the pilot doesn't say you can only you – know, like, you can only fly for 20 years. You know, If you start late, then, hey, you're out Like if you're a good pilot. like To me, like the House of Representatives, um, you have to be 25 years to run. You know, like, or to, you know, to, 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 to be in the house. So like, it's not crazy to then say, okay, well, once you're 75, you can't do it anymore or whatever it is. Like to me, there's, there's an, there's an, there's a start and then there's an end. And I, I think that would solve a lot of these problems. Um, because in that sense, you just don't, the problem of someone staying in too long and just, and the same thing with the, the, the federal judge, by the way, staying in too long and just saying, I'm not leaving because yeah. nobody can make me. And it's like, you know, geez, you know, like, it's I interesting. Thought we were trying to build a government here, not do not, not build something for your own glory. Yeah. And the last thing, because I know you want to jump to the next topic, is um, you know, no, one thing I, I thought of was, as we're you know just preparing for this, is it's interesting because it also kind of is evidence that, you know, at the top, like the government itself doesn't really have a plan for this. That's I think what I'm saying. Part of, part of the issue, <laughs> I think, is we're asking people that are in these positions of power who make rules to make rules that kind of go against their own interests, in a sense. Correct. And we've talked about this in other contexts. Out, the nature of our government requires people to voluntarily comply, in most part, with the, with the kind of the ethos of the system. You can really break things if you don't, if you're like, you know what, I'm not going to play by the rules, you know. And so, Yes, there's little we can do a lot of times in these situations, like with the Thomas issue, if he's going to just lean into conflicts of interest and say, you know, thumb his nose at the system, there's little we can do after the fact. That's why when I was talking about that, it was like more about, okay, well, let's then we see this is happening. Oh, it wasn't officially against the rules. All right, well, let's correct that, you know, because this clearly is something that undermines the body and we don't want the body undermined. If we're, if Americans care, you know, like this is, I, that to me is, is not there's nothing partisan about that. Shouldn't all parties want the government to be legitimate and seen as legitimate? <laughs> you know, so I don't know. I mean, it, no. and then with the, the age, <laughs> we do have some Americans that hate their own government. So you know, maybe yeah, they don't. Man. Well, you know? at least the government, <laughs> if it doesn't agree with them. Yeah. <laughs> but yes, yeah, I think we can move from there. Uh, the The next topic we wanted to discuss, second topic we wanted to discuss today, was just one of these interesting things you see pop up from time to time um, as far as innovation and. The capabilities, uh, you know, because right now and rightfully so, everybody is doom and gloom. Hey, climate change is coming. We're putting too much too much greenhouse gas into the air. It's going to turn our planet into Venus part two with all the the the, the, the carbon dioxide in the in the atmosphere and the greenhouse effect. And so to speak. And lo and behold, we got scientists, you know, we got reports of scientists uh, working on in, an enzyme that can turn CO, pull CO2 out of the air. And turn it into useful products. So, what was your your take? I mean, this isn't something obviously that's commercial yet, but that's kind of the point: is they're trying to take something like that and turn it into a commercially viable thing. So, what was your your thought on on seeing that, or your reaction to seeing yeah, that? Yeah, no, it's it's um, it was interesting. I mean, I think, like you said, right? It's it's hopeful that this could help clean up some of the um, impact that we've had on the planet in these last you know 
100, 200 years of industrial, uh, you know, the industrial age living type of thing. But because I was reading the article, I guess the last numbers reported were from 2021. Uh, we as the U.S. released 6 million metric tons of carbon dioxide uh, into the air that year. And I know that we are the largest producer of these kind of pollutants, but there's, you know, several countries that are not far behind. So I'll assume that, you know, the globe probably put out over 10 trillion. And that just seems like, uh, sorry, 10 million. 10 million tons seems pretty heavy. And so <laughs> if, 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 and I think that's why to go to actually stop on that, I think this is all very hard. It's very abstract for us to get because like we're talking CO2 is in the air. And when you're talking about the weight of something that's in the air, because we can't see it, because it's light enough to float within the air, it makes it very difficult for us to fathom like what does six or 10 million tons look like of this stuff? And so I don't know because I've never seen 10 million tons of air, but um, <laughs> the idea is that if we could take the actual CO2 molecules out of the air and create actual tons of physical material, that could be one way to keep the air clean. Now, that might not help us with the pollution because we're still going to have <laughs> more physical stuff on the planet. Yeah, but- yeah. Well, just uh, what they're able to turn it into is, is you know, they turn it into to glycerate and then they use that to turn it into acrylate, which is the basis of a lot of polymer based products. But yeah, that was my thought. It's like, well, then we're going to have too much of that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> So it's interesting, right? And it goes back to that's what I said, like when when um, we we read the book Sapiens, and the the author did such a great job saying that you know we keep saying like we keep being worried about scarcity, like peak oil, like we're going to run out of oil, or we're going to run out of food, or we're going to run out of this or that. And I think you know, and he said, you know, that's not really our problem because we human beings have shown that they can innovate their way out of a lot of things, and this is a good example of it, right? Yeah. That. We got one problem we want to solve, which is CO2 and greenhouse gases and the warming of the earth. So we, we might end up creating something really that can produce products from the air, right? Pulling CO2 out of the air and creating carbon-based products. Yeah. But like you said, well, we're still going to have a problem where we just still got a lot of trash and pollution because we're just going to keep creating more stuff to try and get it out of the air. Yeah, so we'll have to come what, up with an enzyme that, that takes all that stuff and turns it into something else. Yeah, and so, <laughs> and so kind of what his well, point in the book me, was, well, let me just finish this point, was that um, what we're going to do most likely is still mess up the ecology. And that to me was interesting, which is, yeah, this could be great for the greenhouse gas side of things, but we're just going to create more CO2 based, like plastic and, like you said, polymer based stuff that's going to go in the ocean and go in the ground and still create yeah. some sort of pollution. So we're. Yeah, I mean, so it, it, there is no, like, it's all about trade offs, basically. You know, so it, the, the, the I, I like that you brought up the sapiens thing in terms of us innovating our way out. Cause I thought, yeah, that's, this is great. You know, like, this is great that we're, we're turning the eye of innovation towards, because even if we switch, from carbon, you know, or you know, fossil fuel stuff tomorrow, we still our planet already warmed. I think was it two degrees? Yeah, you know, and like we're already, and we still got so much out there already anyway that it's not like everything is just going to go back to the way it was, and so that's not going to happen. But it would be helpful to have a way to to kind of mitigate the output of CO two, and this would be something like that. So yeah, that could be a tool in our arsenal, you know, so to speak. Uh, you know, a, 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 one of the arrows in our quiver. And well, what's in? Oh, because the right. thing is, well, let me, let me, let me, there's a couple of things I want to mention on this because the thing is, is like what we have here, like it, it, the, the whole idea of the greenhouse effect, you know, Venus is the example of that. Venus is hotter than Mercury, even though Mercury is closer to the sun because gr- Venus has the thick atmosphere with the greenhouse gases in it and, you know, creates a greenhouse effect in the, in, in the, the planet, which it can melt lead on the surface. It's that hot. And that's what we're doing to our, 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 our planet right now. We're, fill in the, the atmosphere with a bunch of greenhouse gases. So if we can, yeah, pull those out, excellent. And, and innovation is the way to go. But for all of these, I think the biggest p- piece to understand here is it's not just going to be one solution. We're not going to just do one thing and then problem solved. It's the way innovation is going to work is there's going to be several things that we're going to do. And it's going to take us, as you pointed out, to a new normal where there's going to be problems with that normal, too. And then we'll have to innovate out of those problems and we'll figure out a way to, to, to do that. And so but under no circumstances, things are going to go back to the way they were. The biggest concern, and this is what just what, again, this is not something that should be political, is like, let's just maintain the ability for this place to be habitable for us. And this seems to be something that would be that would do that. So I'm all in favor of it. Yeah, it's interesting because 
in reading it, um, it says the latest research, a collaboration with Ahmed Badran at Scripps Research Institute and Jimmy Jiang at the University of Cincinnati has been awarded a $50,000 Scilog negative emissions science grant from some big research. I thought, damn, go 50 grand. That ain't going too far. With any research into, like, what's that doing? That's like, that's paying for these guys housing, man. Come on. You know what I mean? Like, really? That's, that's all we're putting behind that's this? All, that's it's all a, we got. Like, Jesus. <laughs> I guess, no, I, I guess I guess the fossil fuel industry really is holding back, huh? On, on, on yeah. this. But well, but yeah, I'll tell you this though: the other the thing about it is, is that obviously we already know ways to turn CO two into useful stuff. You know, the problem is the scale. Plants, yeah, <laughs> photosynthesis, yeah. do this all day, all night. Well, all day you know, when the sun's out and everything, they're turning, they're they're capturing carbon dioxide and they're turning it into stuff that we can use or you know whatever. So. The, the, the concept is already there. It's just whether this can be done at a scale to make a difference in, you know, in terms of, you know, making so the planet doesn't become uninhabitable for us. And so, yeah, I mean, it, you would hope that the investment, you know, like with something like this, you hope that this is the beginning. Like we're hearing about it. We hear about stuff all the time. A couple months ago, it's like, oh, we're figuring out fusion, you know, and it's like, it's not like the world changes in the next day. Like we probably won't hear about this again for another year or two, but hopefully these are the kinds of things, again, to become the, the, to start building up some arrows in our quiver to be able to address some of these issues so that moving forward, you know, again, we can maintain habitability. Yeah. Yeah, man. No, it's so, fascinating because, well, and the last thing I'll say is, you know, you said about the politics of it, and that's kind of the sad part to me. I, I understand people don't like change, but when you read this kind of stuff, it's, it's this is to me what has made the United States awesome in terms of our, our capitalist innovative system. This is innovation and this would lead to more creation of the ability to, to imagine if you could make stuff out of the air, you know, you could open a small business printing, you know, we got 3d printers. Now you could have the printing stuff, you know, eventually from, <laughs> from the air outside. So, you know, why not continue to go down this road? And it's, and it's again, not about being liberal or conservative or being a tree hugger or not. It just seems like this stuff makes sense. And, and well, see, but like, that's the, and, I'm glad you brought this up and, because that's the danger of either doing it yourself or allowing other people to do it for you, making issues that aren't political issues, making them political. Because we could easily see in our quote unquote culture wars that somebody invents some kind of enzyme that does this. And some people come out and say, no, we don't want to do this. This is, this is yeah. against our whatever. They, they, and, and, it, logically, it won't make sense, but they'll make it about a political identity that, hey, no, we want to pollute, you know, and that's because we see that we see it's like, hey, a part of our political identity is to put as much CO2 in the air as possible. Why? Because we can't. And so it, th th that's the danger when you when you see it happen. It's like, look, this is not a political. This is not an inherently political issue, but you will see people make it political in order to prevent something from happening that they individually don't want to happen, but that most people would be ambivalent about at worst. Yeah. Yeah. So. So. Well, yeah, man. We appreciate everybody for joining us on this episode of Call Like I See it. It, it. Subscribe to the podcast. Rate it. Review us. Tell us what you think. Send it to a friend. Until next time, I'm James Keys. I'm Tunde Wanlana. All right. We'll talk to you next time.